which is going to be released in May 2025. We are thrilled that she's with us here tonight. And everybody, will you please join me in welcoming Cheyenne and Marie C. I just want to thank you all for being here and helping to, su to support Inspire. It's kind of a miracle that I'm even here speaking to all of you today. And truly, without this organization, I wouldn't be. When I think back on my entire educational journey, sometimes I can hardly believe how I managed to accomplish everything that I have. Years ago, I sat on a metal seat in a cold booth facing a pane of plexiglass. My father entered the cubicle on the other side of the barrier. He placed his veiny brown hand on the glass and I brought mine up, mirroring his. Nearly 13 years later, this memory flashed before me as I transcribed audio recorded interviews with prisoners housed in Bowdoin Institution. Bowdoin is where my father was incarcerated for two and a half years for molesting my older sister and was then where I was doing research for the University of Alberta Prison Project. I am a Cree woman who grew up with a drug dealing, gang affiliated father and the first to take Columbia's creative nonfiction writing program. Growing up, most of my family didn't graduate high school, let alone university. I didn't even know what university was, and yet somehow I ended up graduating with my master's degree from one of the top universities in the world. I was always an intelligent young girl, but because of all the difficulties I experienced at a very young age, I ended up turning to drugs and alcohol as a way to cope, which resulted in me getting expelled from high school in grade 11. It was an old principle of mine that helped me start turning my life around a year later. I owe a lot in my life to certain adults that refused to give up on me, my mother being at the forefront who's here tonight. At 19 years old, I started thinking about my future and what I should do with my life. That's when I discovered what a student loan was, and when I saw how much it would cost me, I took a pause and thought, okay, Shiana, what is it that you really want to do? Throughout my whole life, I have always been writing. As soon as I learned how, I was writing songs, which evolved into poetry, which evolved into fiction, all of which encompassed my nonfiction. I thought, if I'm going to invest this amount of money into myself, then I want to pursue my dream of becoming a writer and a creative writing professor. I started researching programs and set my sights on the University of Alberta. I worked my full-time job by day, went to classes at night, and I finished my English 30 and Social 30 with over 95%. I was at work when I received my letter of acceptance into the U of A. My chest was heavy and tears welled. As I read the words, the weight sunk in. I was the first member of my family to go to university. On my dad's side, no one finished high school. I graduated with a BA in English and Creative Writing in spring of 2020. During my BA, I took an English class with Dr. Karen Ball, who introduced me to trauma theory. I applied those theories to traumatic memoirs, such as Art Spiegelman's Mouse 1 and 2. For the first time in university, I didn't experience imposter syndrome. I belonged in that English class and naturally gravitated toward fictional representations of trauma. By the last semester of my degree, I finally felt ready to start telling my own story, and I began writing my memoir, which is now set to be released by House of Anansi in May 2025. Trauma defined my childhood, and creative writing has given me an outlet to work through and express those experiences. When my father was incarcerated, I would lock myself in my bedroom and write. I wrote him letters that I never sent, poems I never shared, and imaginary stories with alternate endings. Writing is catharsis, and it is single-handedly the most powerful tool I have ever used on my healing journey. 
University and education has given me so many tools to analyze, interpret, and work through those traumatic experiences within my writing. In my classes, I was experimenting and naturally blended my poetic voice within my prose, which has become my strength as a writer. Even though academically I was thriving, I struggled immensely financially. My family's situation necessitated that I work 30 hours per week while enrolled in university. I was not like my peers. I had to pay for my rent and all my costs of living. This situation affected my grades, but with a 3.1 GPA, I still received acceptance into one of the world's most prestigious universities. My grades are not what set me apart from the thousands of other applicants with perfect 4.0 GPAs and legacy families. It was my strength as a writer and my story that paved the way for my acceptance. When I got the acceptance call from Columbia, I collapsed on my living room floor and started sobbing. <clears throat> as if years of everything I had been carrying all came off of me at once. How did I? <laughs> Cheyenne Marie Sage, just a girl from the hood in Edmonton, <laughs> daughter of a drug dealer, make it to where I am now. I knocked on some doors and they opened, but how on earth would I be able to pay for it? It's a fallacy that Indigenous people get all their education paid for. I'm a registered member of Louisville Nation, but they operate on a lottery system, and I was never chosen to receive funding throughout my university career. Even amidst all the financial insecurity I faced and racking up thousands of dollars in student debt, I still knew that I was on the right path. I was doing what I had to do to reach my goals and dreams. I could feel it in every ounce of my bones that I was meant to take that program. I started researching all the options for funding for students studying outside of Canada, and the options were and are limited. That's how I discovered INSPIRE. It's one of the only organizations that will provide funding if you are studying outside of Canada. This is an initiative that changed my life and allowed me to pursue my education at my dream school. I created a financial plan that would allow me to move and with my Indigenous status card, I would be able to apply for student aid in the U.S. But, when I was at the border, I was detained by border police for over five hours, interrogating me about my entire family lineage. They told me I needed a blood quantum letter in order to be admitted under the J-Treaty. And in Canada, most tribes do not offer those. They're considered very antiquated and barbaric. But in the U.S., on all of their status cards, they have their blood quantum. So the police refused to admit me on my status card, and instead I had to enter the country as an F1 student, which meant that my plans of working and paying for my rent while in the country would not work. It meant I did not qualify to apply for U.S. student aid. So there I was, arriving in New York City for the first time, by myself, after having sold all of my possessions, two suitcases to my name, equally as excited as I was stressed. When the funding from INSPIRE came through, I was sitting in Central Park, on a bench, watching a flock of ducks pecking at some grass. I had $100 in my bank account and no idea how I was going to be able to feed myself or pay my rent for the next few weeks. INSPIRE literally fed me, paid for my rent, and allowed me room to breathe while I was working hard that first year at Columbia. And even still, I only had just enough to get by. <coughs> Even though I was facing extreme financial and food insecurity that first year of the program, I still managed to become the social media manager for the Columbia Journal, taught at Children of Promise, a place where most of their children, all of their parents are incarcerated. I was on the reading board for the Incarcerated Writers Initiative and was writing thousands of words every day towards my memoir. By the second year of the program, I became the director of the Incarcerated Writers Initiative I was the social media manager for the Columbia Fitness Center. I started writing for the Huffington Post, landed an agent, and was at the top of my class. <laughs> All of 
these pivotal career building moments would not be possible if I didn't go to Columbia. It was the most fulfilling and enriching experience of my life and the only thing that was challenging were the financial barriers. For most students, it is the financial barriers that prevent us from achieving all of our dreams. My story is simply one story among thousands for Indigenous students, a microcosm. During the program, I landed a book deal with House of Anansi, Canada's top independent publisher, for my memoir, Soft as Bones. I also fell in love with screenwriting and was able to take TV writing courses, which have impacted the career I envisioned for myself moving forward. I wrote 70,000 words toward my memoir, I wrote a TV pilot, and accomplished every single one of my goals I set for myself before entering the program. And I just finished writing a short film that I hope to produce in the coming months. But none of this would have been possible if I didn't go to Columbia, as all the connections I made there are what put me in the position I am in today. And if it wasn't for Inspire, I never would have been able to attend Columbia. Inspire changed my life, and I wouldn't have my book deal without their financial support while I was working on it. I am simply a girl who had every odd and obstacle stacked against her, but an unnatural will and refusal to crumble under pressure. I know in my heart that there are thousands of Cheyennes out there who are destined to accomplish, inspire, and share their perspectives in this world but the reality is that we just need a little bit of help along the way. Your being here tonight tells me that you're committed to giving that life-changing help. So thank you for listening to my story, thank you for being here, and thank you for helping all those other Cheyennes out there. <laughs>